Hey everyone, welcome to the Mega Mocap VR Explained video where I'm going to go over all the aspects of the system so you can modify it to suit your needs. I kind of want to go over a few things of how Mega Mocap VR works, kind of a high overview of how everything fits together, and which is also kind of by virtue how Unreal Engine works. A lot of the systems are basically uh, how Unreal Engine deals with how you move skeletal meshes and the like. So if we look at this graph, we have the Mocap Actor Blueprint. And that's just a blueprint that you make that houses the skeletal mesh as well as the animation blueprint that's going to drive that skeletal mesh and make it move, as well as the mocap actor component, which is kind of specific to the motion capture system that I've made, Mega Mocap VR. So every skeletal mesh needs uh, an animation blueprint to actually move around. And you see attached to that animation blueprint, kind of inside the anim graph, is a control rig. So what happens with the system is we have the mocap actor component is getting the information about the skeletal mesh, how tall it is, what the, the bone names are, etc. It's sending that to the player pawn, and then the player pawn uses that to kind of create some offsets on the, the trackers, and then it sends that tracking data to the animation blueprint. And then that ends up feeding down into control rig. So that's essentially the process of what we're going to be going over today. I just want to show everyone kind of a bird's eye view of what it looks like before we go any further. So you'll probably notice when you go to, to GitHub to get the project, you have all these options on, on GitHub. For instance, you can download uh, everything as a zip, which is what I typically recommend. Um, there's different branches here. So like you can actually even go back to the first iterations of the project. And we can actually even switch over to this branch and see what the last thing was called. It was called VR mocap back then, and uh, it was the walk animation cleanup. That's that's what I did in that one. One thing that I started to do with all my commits, if I just go into my commits here, um, let's see, this is where you can see like basically all the versions that I've put up. Um, so you can actually download older versions of of the project if you just like go into here. Like this is the total props update that was committed in May. Um, say if something broke, you want to roll back, you can just download the project from here. So if you hit browse files, basically that makes it so this commit is um, what you would download as a zip file, which is your typical way of how you get stuff. So we just took a look at GitHub. I'm going to do a speed run of how to set up the project. There's, if you're looking for this information, it's also on the wiki and also I have two other set of videos. Uh, check out my channel for those. Um, but what you want to do is you want to launch the engine and we're just going to make a new blank project. Okay, so this is the code that we just downloaded from GitHub. Um, most of the stuff in this folder is irrelevant. Uh, it's kind of needed for GitHub, this like Git uh, file in particular, and like the examples. Um, but what we really want is this Mega Mocap VR folder. So here we have our blank project. I'm just going to open up the content drawer, and I'm going to right click and show an explorer. So content is where all of our basically assets end up in an Unreal Engine project. I'm basically going to drag this folder over into the content folder. And you can see it populates right there. And this is what you get when you download the GitHub directory. So the most important things are in the root. For instance, an example level that's kind of set up for motion capture already, movement actor example, and an OSC kind of blank level that's kind of lighter weight to render. Uh, we also have the player pond, very important. Scene locator, somewhat important. I mean, not as important as the player pond, and the spectator cam. Um, but if we open up the example level, we're going to see that there's a bunch of errors, a bunch of things that uh, aren't working because there aren't uh, plugins installed. So you can see need, missing plugins. It needs all these things. So Unreal Engine is really cool in that you can just say enable missing, and that almost gets all of them. But you'll notice there's some things like this uh, blueprint bad. Like, what does that mean, blueprint bad? Uh, if you open up the uh, blueprint to edit it, you can see if we compile, there are some, uh, some of these warnings. They're not necessarily errors. Um, so these are saying, hey, there's no input action. Well, that's because if we open up the input graph, I'm re referencing buttons that it doesn't quite understand like what that action is. So to fix that, we just go into project settings. Let's move this out of the way of my head a little bit. So here under input, this is where you can set up action mappings. This is like prior to the enhanced input system. Um, up here, you have an import. Just open up um, the GitHub repo that we just downloaded. There is an input field here. So like this .ini file is kind of a settings file that'll give us all of our mappings. The VR input's a little finicky. Sometimes these won't work. If they don't work, what I typically do is I just like 
switch this from something completely garbage and then I go back to, was this trigger? All right. So, and then I just switch it back to trigger. And that typically solves it for me. There's a few other things you can do. Um, I have a list in my Discord of uh, kind of input troubleshooting. But anyways, we're, this is a speed run. We don't have time to, to waste on that. Um, but now if we uh, compile, see all those uh, warnings go away. But our blueprint's still bad. Uh, why is that? So if we click on this, you can see it's relating to this object here, which is a child blueprint. And if we click on this little folder, it will browse to that asset in the kind of content uh, folder. And that's this quick select menu. So if I double click on that, you can see, oh, yeah, there's, there's some more errors here. What's going on here? Well, it's saying it, uh, this pin doesn't exist. So play Steam VR haptic feedback. It doesn't understand what Steam VR haptic feedback is because that plugin doesn't exist in the system. So we're going to install a few more plugins. So if you're wondering what all the plugins you need for this project are, just go to our wiki. So if we scroll down a bit, we get down to the first time setup. This is a great kind of rundown of what you need to do for your first time setup. Mostly it's installing plugins and knowing what your kind of live link device IDs are on your trackers. But anyways, you can see we need live link, live link XR, Apple AR kit face support, um, control rig, full body. A lot of these are actually already included in the engine. They were preview when I first made this. Um, and that's why they weren't like default into the engine. But here you can see Apple AR kit. Yeah, let's get that one. Live link XR, because it looks like live link is already uh, enabled. And we want Steam VR as well as OSC. OSC is like mostly important if you want to send the signal out, um, send your tracking data out to another version of the engine. Um, but yeah, that's that. I'm going to restart now. We don't need to save. We didn't really do any changes to the level. All right, so we're back in our test project. All we need to do is open up the content browser and go to the Mega Mocap VR example level, which is kind of a, how I'd expect you to do motion capture. It's got all the major components as well as some tutorial information. There's a player pawn in the scene, there's a spectator camera scene, and some notes like in the green, for instance, like that the player pawn is set to auto possess player zero. So it's going to get like the um, player controller zero and all the inputs associated with that. But uh, that's just kind of meant for you to um, set up your trackers and then press play. Now you will probably encounter this error unless you have a meta human in the project. This just means we have an animation blueprint. So let's go to this animation blueprint is referencing a skeleton that's not there. Um, you can, if you're really upset by this error, you could probably just choose like a different skeleton and let's just choose a new one. Sure. And yeah, that might be compile errors, but uh, well, we can just see pose. Yeah, just get rid of this. How about now? Now it's happy. Uh, now if we press play, no errors. Um, Typically, when you find an error in the project, I made things somewhat modular, so you can just kind of delete that one component. Um, there are exceptions, but here you are. You, you're in the project, and uh, one thing of note is this player pawn has this variable, this public variable called debug strings HUD on. So when I turn that off, here, I'll just turn that off, you don't get any of that text on screen. And so I put I, this is on for the example level, just so you can see exactly everything that's happening. Like for instance, there is no valid uh, tracker information because if we look at our player pawn under live link tracker struct set, none of these are set. Um, so that's just kind of a, a quick heads up. Like if you're having problems with the system, you need to debug it. Typically the strings will tell you a lot of information. Also, uh, if you open up the project and then you right click and run this editor utility widget, this thing here, if I press play, you can see you get a ton of information here, like if you're in calibration control, what mode you're in, which is calibration, what actor profile you're using, what the actor name is. So like another debugging thing is you'll see that these rings are kind of snapping to the actor. There's kind of a lot of systems to tell you what's going on under the hood. And so, um, yeah, I'd recommend using this when you're, when you're using the project. Um, but yeah, that's a look at everything uh, as far as like setting up the project. Before we continue onward, I kind of want to just go over quickly how the folder structure is set up. So we've got a folder for animation blueprints. Uh, we were just there and we kind of reset our metahuman skeleton to a, a cube, apparently. Um, there is uh, assets, which is where all the skeletal meshes are, the static meshes, um, for instance, like we've got like some camera stuff in here, lights, etc., as well as textures. So for the UI, for instance, this thing, 
it's getting a lot of its textures from this directory here. Outside of that, like the most important folder uh, would be the components. And this is where the important blueprints, um, say the light rig are, are living, um, the movement actor, a POV cam, props, um, with their, there's just like a bunch of stuff in here, kind of tools that will help you with your filmmaking. And so, yeah, that's kind of how things are structured. And the last folder is control rigs. And you can always open up these if you want to see how I'm doing the full body solve based on the goals. So, yeah, that's how everything's structured. And that's pretty much how easy it is to get set up. Um, I've set up this project hundreds of times. That's all you have to do. You have to just drag it in using uh, Windows Explorer. You have to install some plugins. And then if you really are wanting to get the, the full setup, you'll use LiveLink XR, um, add your XR devices, and then a list will populate here of all the VR devices you have. And then inside the player pawn, you can just populate those in here. And you can save uh, that setup of what tracker is driving what body part and load that in. And if you don't want to, um, if you want so every time you use your player pawn, that um, that information, those trackers are relating to the right body part, you can find that live link. Let's see, live link tracker struct in here. So you can see it's uh, under public settings. This is where I put all the public variables. You can change the default values here, and then anytime you drag in that player pawn, it'll have those, those values. Yep, that's it. So what my thinking of with the project was, I wanted to use VR hardware to drive a character in Unreal Engine. And how do you create animation on an object? Well, you need a skeletal mesh, and that skeletal mesh needs an animation blueprint. So inside the Mega MoCap VR folder, we have a bunch of animation blueprints. Now these are ones for predetermined skeleton types like Character Creator 3. There's also um, an IK retarget blueprint, UE4 Manny, UE5 Manny, and also metahumans. So if you wanted to make your own uh, animation blueprint, you could duplicate one of these, like you retarget and uh, duplicate and retarget. But what's important to know is that if you have a new skeleton in your system, it's either got to reference one of the skeletons that's in my system, which you can do on import, or you can assign the skeleton at a later date, or you've got to essentially make a new animation blueprint to drive that skeleton. So I'm going to open up the UE5 Manny animation blueprint, and it looks like there's a lot going on. We can go over it really quickly. Um, first, we're saving a pose, and that's this pose here. This A pose is what we're saving, and we're going to use that later on in the animation graph. We're checking for a mocap actor component. So the way the system works, and I'll just open up one of my um, characters. So we have a blueprint that has all the information that we need for our actor. We have our skeletal mesh. That skeletal mesh has the animation blueprint, which we're actually we're looking at that one right now. This is this animation blueprint. I've also got this new component that I made called the mocap actor component. And this is uh, might as well open it up and show everyone how it works. First important step on the mocap actor component is it's trying to find what is the skeleton because you might have multiple skeletons in your blueprint. If you're having problems with like the system finding your skeleton, just type in the name. So for instance, SKM Manny Face is what our skeleton's named. You could just do that and then the system will be like, okay, we're just going to use that component. But if nothing's provided, it'll kind of go through this process based on what actor profile you're using. So I'll go back to here. One of the public variables is this mocap actor rig enum. And so that's basically the different skeleton types that I kind of have in my system. There's some work in progress ones. There's some metahumans. Um, it, basically, this is going to, when you set this, it's going to split apart and find, try to find um, the character based on certain kind of tells of wh what the UE4 Manny, for instance, has. So a UE Manny 4 will have a bone that's called pelvis, um, typically. Actually, most of these have that. <laughs> pelvis is also through the character creator 3. But essentially, that actor profile, which is, um, you can basically modify, you can add more stuff to it. Um, it's under, I think, assets. We can even just search for it. Let's see. Actor rig. This here. These are all the options um, with some nice tool tips of what they are. You can make new ones and then um, have like your own custom logic. I would recommend just maybe using custom for that. Just like 
if you're gonna make your own actor kind of profile, use that. And then once all that's done, then we're gonna calculate the actor height. So this is kind of where like all the, um, the oh, th this is probably one of the most important steps is getting the actor profile bone names. So here's the entry point. Sorry if that's unclear, because this is kind of a mess. <laughs> um, it's again, gonna use that, that enum, that basically the actor profile thing that we saw to switch the logic. And I have, I know for instance, that the character creator, um, this is what the bone name is. Like this is what their eye is called. This is what their head is called, their spine, et cetera. What makes this whole thing difficult with motion capture is like, especially if you're people using um, uh, other characters that aren't like UE4 Manny, UE, UE5 Manny, who knows what the bones are called and what, what order they're in, or even what the orientations are. Like all that stuff is very important for how all this works. So um, if you do have a different setup, you could go into, where's the custom? There is a data table, it looks like I set up for that. So if you wanna find that data table, it's here. And so this is like the, what's in the data table, you can just edit this and then like, it'll populate um, this, this, this is the important thing, this struct. It'll basically tell the system, hey, this is the eye bone, this is the head, this is the chest. All that stuff kind of comes back into play during calibration because those are the IK points that we're gonna be driving, the kind of goals that we're gonna be driving. So the system needs to know what they're called. So then like, for instance, we're also using that information here. Like we're using the feet to um, basically get the distance from the feet to the eyes and that's how tall the actor is, which is important for when you calibrate, it'll try to scale you to match your actor's height. Um, and if you're not the mocap target, so you'll notice inside of here, there is, is mocap target, which is checked on. If this is off, that's as far as the mocap uh, actor component is gonna go. But if you have that checked on, it's gonna send all this information, the, the bone names, the, um, the height, all that stuff, it's gonna send it to the player pawn and also tell the player pawn, hey, this is the actor you're targeting right now to motion capture. This mocap actor component, it's very important for just like getting like information about the actor and that, uh, that information comes back in various places. In fact, it even comes back in the animation blueprint. So that's why we're checking for that um, mocap actor component. It used to be that like, I would have the finger curls that were calculated. Um, basically the team had this skeletal system that based on input, it would uh, drive kind of finger bends. So that used to be in every single animation blueprint. But because SteamVR is deprecated, I had to move all the finger stuff to uh, an object that I spawn in, which, um, let's, yeah, let's go over that really quickly. Sorry for jumping around a bit. So I think under here, SteamVR hands, let's look at this. All right, so this is the animation blueprint for some SteamVR hands. This object, if you're in um, SteamVR mode in 5.1, will spawn in. You might have to delete this in 5.2, but how this works is, in the event graph, uh, we're turning Steam VR finger curls on, and then every tick, we're basically getting those finger curls here and setting that to um, the struct here, which will basically say, how much is the thumb curled? How much is the index curled? All that kind of stuff. And basically all that stuff uh, is being calculated in this little kind of modular actor that's being spawned here. So it's easy to delete this out of the project. So in 5.2, you would just delete this because it's probably going to give you an error. But that's why I put it up here in pink. Anything deprecated, you could probably delete it if you want. I've, I'm keeping it around because interesting stuff like in Unreal Engine, if you have a note like this and it's deprecated, you can't actually add that note. Like if I do set curls, you see like I don't have access to that note anymore. Like they just basically stripped it out from like the blueprint uh, fuzzy finder. I don't even think I can copy and paste this. Yeah, you cannot paste it. So that's why I leave things around. Sorry if it's a little bit messy, but I do comment them. <laughs> so this is a, a, a really important uh, area, and this is where all the Mega Mocap VR interface functions uh, occur. So an interface is kind of how blueprints can communicate to each other, even if they don't know what each other are. So for instance, it's like, I know that this is an object that exists. I'm gonna just send it a message, and if it implements this interface, it's gonna use it. Um, if it doesn't implement the interface, uh, it won't use it. So if you go into class settings, um, you can see implemented interfaces. You can add another one. Interfaces are really cool because basically instead of casting, like casting um, is just too limiting. 
Um, this is just a lot, lot better. It's like a better cast. <laughs> um, where casting is useful is like if you need to like specifically like call a function like that you know exists on something, then you like, okay, I'm gonna grab that object, cast to it, and say, hey, is it this object? Okay, it is. I'm gonna run this function or, or changing a variable. But otherwise, this is some some information that gets sent to the actor right when we calibrate. Like, are we missing any trackers? Because that's gonna basically impact the control rig. Um, what's the iPhone name? Because that's going to basically impact the blend shapes. Uh, let's see. Goal transforms. Uh, that's basically the, the tracking information itself. Um, for instance, here's like the head goal transform, the chest. So this is being set every tick. And uh, it's a lot of information, as you imagine. Tracker controlled is a very important uh, float because if I press play here, you can see we have, or in calibration mode, if we calibrate trackers, then tracker control, this float goes up. So if that's one, you're going to get 100% of the alpha of the tracker goal stuff. Because I have no trackers, it's kind of like folding in on itself. It's going to zero, zero, zero. But um, in the system here, this is now like one. And it basically opens up this gate here, this tracker controlled gate. Actually, let's see. So yeah, basically this is like how you debug like what objects are actually you know being played right now in the game. Um, so you can see like because the gate opened because of the the tracker controlled uh, goals is more than zero, it opens up this branch and that's where we're like doing all the stuff that like all the calculations that you want when you're in a character, like the eye rotation, um, jaw rotation, uh, etc. Okay, so anyways, we're setting a bunch of stuff that we can use later on in the animation graph. So let's go over the animation graph. So the input pose, um, I don't know what it is, but that's where things start. Who knows where it comes from? It's the greatest mystery known to man. Um, but <laughs> after that, I'm using this thing called a slot default slot. So what this is, is like whenever you have a level sequence that's using this actor, that's the kind of um, field where the animation is going to go. What's cool is like you can blend this with all sorts of stuff, which is kind of what I'm doing. For instance, this is like now I'm calling this the input pose. Input pose is going here, and this is where it's getting kind of modified to have like the blend shapes from the AR kit, the Apple AR kit, which again, this, this phone name, we saw where it came from, right? It came from over here. Basically, this was sent on time of, of you are an actor now. Uh, the, the player prawn let it know what, um, what iPhone name to use. But you could also be using that um, audio-based mouth movement, which is just going to like listen to your microphone, whatever your current active input is, and just do this to a bone, which you set here, like just set the bone to modify right there. But you can see here, also using that input pose, we're basically caching this pose and using it multiple places here. And we might actually even use it later on. Okay, so then we get this thing called AR kit face. That's like the, the default slot and also the, the iPhone stuff that's all put together. And then that goes into this control rig. Now, I don't know, should we go into the control rig? This is kind of like the beating heart of the system. Um, basically, all those transforms you saw earlier, the goal struct, that's going in there. If we're using just upper body mode only, it's also getting like if there's no chest tracker, if there's no elbow tracker, um, that kind of information, how springy the goal should be. Let's do it. Let's open up the control rig. This thing is heavy. This thing is um, it's kind of a little bit cumbersome to work in. But um, even though this is deprecated, don't worry about it. Uh, essentially, there is a setup phase where I'm basically setting here. We actually just go to construction script. That's what happens is I'm setting up these controls so that like we find the chest uh, bone and we put which is called spine 05 in this character. We put the a control there. Basically setting up all the controls that we're going to need to modify later on using those uh, the input transform data that's coming from the trackers. But anyways, all that stuff is the setup phase. This is the forward solve. So what I'm doing is I'm basically getting from that struct, which again, the player pawn is sending the struct to each control rig, or rather to the animation blueprint, which then goes to the control rig. So yeah, we're going, um, getting all that uh, transform data, and that's going to basically pull all these control rig points around. And so it's going to do this. This is basically how we're doing all this stuff. So we do that for every single control. If there's one that's a fake control, then I'm kind of doing some math and saying, oh, for instance, for this fake chest, let's just put something that's in between the head goal and the pelvis goal and just like lurk between the two. And that's how we do that. 
Um, there's a lot of fake controls. There's also like fake elbow controls, which I think are down here. Yeah, here's fake knees. Everyone always asks me to put in knees. I'm not going to, because I'm gonna use the fake knees forever. You can't make me, but it's, if you wanted to make your own, that uh, your own system, I'm gonna make my own Mega Mocap VR. It's gonna have blackjack and hookers uh, and knee trackers. Then you basically, you do the kind of logic that I'm doing here in the elbows, but here. We are basically then gonna get into the actual solve. And that's like down here, this is all the solve stuff. So I'm doing spine rotation where I'm using rotation constraints. So it's splitting the difference, like each um, kind of, I think it's like between like the spine 05 and the pelvis, I'm just like kind of saying, okay, here for spine 01, we're looking at the chest control and the hips control. Let's just do a 10% and 90%. So 90% of the hips, um, and it just keeps getting, as the bones go up and kind of get in the middle, like for instance here, spino three is in the middle, it's half and half. And so that's like a really good technique if you want to have some kind of twisty thing in control rig. Then it goes into the, the full body IK. No one knows how this works. <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> um, then you basically, I'm fitting everything on a spline. I don't know if this is good or not, but my idea with this is like, I found that sometimes I was getting strange shapes out of the other solve. So here, let's turn on the debug. So I'm just trying to like, yeah, you can see like there, I'm just like trying to create a softer spine. Um, then we go into the arm. So like after that, I'm even though I have the full body rig, I want some pole control over the arm. So that's why I'm using the basic IK here. And I'm using that fake elbow tracker or your real elbow tracker um, here. So like you can see the pole vector is your elbow offset. Then doing some twist bone stuff and um, some clav movement stuff, I don't know. Uh, this clav movement will often mess up your original basic IK. So then I just do another basic IK after that. And then we could do this crazy finger stuff, which I don't think I wanna get into, but if you want to in the system, this is really good for cleanup. You have like these awesome finger controls, which is kind of like, this is a mini version of the hand rig that I used to use. And actually I think I still do use in the animation blueprint. Yeah, this hand rig here. But I made like a mini version of that that's like a little bit different, just in case you wanted to clean up the full body um, for any of your animations. And actually I've been using this a ton for the 48 hour film I just did. That's the control rigs. Um, yeah, you can see here the, the finger data goes into the hand one. And then we can bypass all that stuff if we're in iPhone only mode, which is a, a player pawn option. I'll just open up the player pawn. Where is it? iPhone only mode. If you do iPhone only mode, it's gonna skip all the control rig stuff and it's just going to use the face data and um, any kind of default slot animations you have. So say if you wanna do a VTuber where like, you just have like a sitting idle or like a walking idle or whatever, um, you could have a, a level sequence play that on the character and then just add your animation on top using AR face kit. I did add something cool though. So there's a control rig that I made. Well, I guess I could just show you using my iPhone. I think I remember my IP address. Yeah, there it is. So um, then you just go into here. All right, so now I'm gonna press play. So now we're in iPhone mode. We can see the hands are gonna to wanna to stay in the spot, even though I'm like having some like kind of light twisting. Um, so if we're not using tracker controlled goals, we'll just go straight to the input, which is like all this stuff. This is like basically, as I was saying, the level sequence stuff or if you have a blend tree set up somewhere or something, which probably you'd want your blend tree back here, or calibration override. So remember 30 minutes ago, or I don't even know how long ago it was, when I said the first thing we do is we save a snapshot, this pose snapshot. Well, cool thing is you can actually use that pose snapshot. So when we enter calibration mode, like it'll basically just make sure that they go into that A pose. It, that's, that's it, that's the, that's the animation blueprint. In the animation graph, we saw the transform struct and we're like, okay, great. And that we know that that's being set here using uh, this, this interface. But how doth get goal transform? Okay, so this is the Mega MoCat VR player pawn. And let's just actually, I'm just gonna um, go through the components on the left side, and then we're gonna talk about the event graph and the uh, input graph. Okay, so we've got the default scene route. Probably one of the most important parts of the system is this VR rig scale. So I'm just gonna unfold that. So what's inside of here? Well, it might be easier if I actually drag them out. 
these are our little mock-up trackers. These are our static meshes that um, kind of represent the trackers in space. And you can see this one is called Vive Tracker 1 Pelvis. This one is intended to drive the pelvis of your character. And we'll, we'll get into how that actually happens later on. But what's also important to know is inside of there, there's a pelvis goal. So how the system works is this tracker will be floating around. Let me just actually turn this off. So it'll be floating around like this, doing whatever your tracker is doing in real life. But this orientation and like the way it is on your body might not be how it is in the character you're driving. Like for instance, the chest bone is typically, um, well, it's inside the chest. How could you get a tracker in there? Well, the solution is once we calibrate this little tiny pelvis uh, goal inside of there, this little child object, it'll basically snap to where that object is in whatever orientation it is. And then this thing can still be like doing its tracker thing. And it basically will offset that, that intended goal, that IK goal of like, oh, I want to drive the spine. It'll still drive all that but with the proper orientation um, that the bone requires. So we have all the, the trackers that we can use in the system, even the HMD, which is an actual, just a camera. Um, so when you're using the system in VR, it'll basically use this for the head. So also underneath the VR rig scale, and the reason why it's called that is because oftentimes we will be scaling this up and down to match the character size that you're, you're trying to motion capture to. But there's also these quick select menus. And so whenever you press the inputs, um, we'll get to the input graph later, but whenever you press those, these little child blueprints spawn. And they're kind of like a rip off of the Half-Life Alex menu, which I really love. You just press a button, you go up, left, right, or down. If you want to see how these work, click on this little magnifying glass and it'll take you right there to the quick select menu, which we opened up earlier today because it had a little error in it. And then also in there is the player forward. So when you're moving around, like your pelvis is moving around, this thing is trying to like determine what your forward is. So for instance, I'm standing here, like basically that arrow is going to be pointing forward and it's trying to like put the circle underneath me to determine what your center of gravity is. I think it's using like the left foot, the right foot and the, and the, the hips. Um, and so this is very important because like this one, the mocap actor forward, this thing snaps to the actor that you're intending to motion capture. And a lot of the code in the system will try to like basically reconcile the two. So like the two are um, aligned. And then there's also a little cheeky hidden IK retargeting source. Basically, when you're doing IK retargeting, inside the player pond, there is a skeletal mesh that you're going to be basically driving the animations on this, and that's going to be transferring the data onto your IK target. So that's essentially the player pond. Let's open up the input graph. And oh, it's a lot, right? <laughs> Maybe not go over everything, but we'll go over what's important. Um, I'd say what's important is this event tick. If we're in iPhone only mode, it bypasses a ton of logic. So that's what's happening here. So there, there is this new thing that I just introduced probably three or four commits ago, which is the tracking method enum. Let's just look at this on the player pawn. You can see here tracking method. We've got Steam VR, which is the 5.1 method. MMVR OSC, and this is how you'd actually receive um, OSC signals from either this system or say if you have some other kind of motion capture system, you could actually send it via OSC and get tracking data that way. There's also OpenXR, which is work in progress. Right now it does nothing. Um, and we also have Breckel OSC. So Breckel is this uh, tool that you can buy that basically, actually I'll launch it. It's pretty cool. It'll tell you like what um, lighthouses you have, what trackers you have, all that kind of stuff. And you can actually use it to um, export uh, over the network via OSC. So the system will actually take that as well. So you can see SteamVR is the only one that does anything. Let's open this up. So we're using this public variable, which you, you can set all these values on here. These are where all your um, live link device IDs go. It's using those to feed into the different areas. So for instance, here's head. And it's, test, it's getting the name and evaluating live link frame so we're going to put that back onto the tracker that you saw that's inside the system here. For instance, head, this tracker here, that's where it gets its transform data. And all this tracking data, uh, when you get it via the system, 
it's all based on the center of your play space, which is like your VR room, your center. Um, that's what VR scale is. That's like zero, zero, zero in your IRL play space. When you set up your play space and you like point the, the controller, the Steam VR controller at the screen and you say, this is my screen, that's changing the rotation of the, the play space. And also inside the system, when you're using this thing, the scene locator, your play space is also snapping to this. And I did that because if you want to do like multiple captures with multiple people, I wanted everyone to be aligned so that like the play space is like in the same spot, the orientation of the actors to each other is in the same spot. So we're setting that uh, based on um, live link names. If the live link name is invalid, for instance, here, if I click on this, if the, the tracker name is none, which that's typically how I'll just get rid of a tracker if I don't want it in my system, if I'm not using it, you just go into here and you delete. So even if it says none, that's fine. But like as long as it's, it, there's no valid name in there, it's going to say, okay, that, that tracker doesn't exist. And that's going to create those um, bools that's like no chest mode, no, no elbow mode, no foot mode, et cetera. So once you set up all your device IDs in here, like the, which tracker belongs to which point, you can actually save live link trackers and that'll make a mapping that's external to the Mega Mocap VR system. It's basically a player save file. So that way you can update the system and retain all your live link track. And you can move it from system to system. You can move that save file and load it and it should populate this, uh, this struct with all the live link names. Remember how I said I, we have the mocap actor forward and then our um, player forward? This is where I'm calculating that stuff. So I'm, basically I want both to have like, what is the actor forward and your forward, the IRL your forward and the mocap actor forward. I want to know what both of those are so I can basically put them together and make sure that they're aligned. Or here, update actor location to player root. So this switches, there's a lot of switching happening. Like, are we in locator mode? If not, that changes the logic. But all you need to know is like what's happening in this phase is like I'm trying to basically put the you and the mocap actor in the same spot. Different stuff happens if you're in the character movement mode. Um, this is basically the trackers will um, have a different space. Um, I think it's all in relation to the pelvis. Oh, here we go. Update goals based on root. Okay. Here, get relative offset to root. Oh, that's what it is. I'm not using the pelvis. I'm using the mocap actor forward. But kind of at the end of this chain, I'm sending off all the goals um, as a struct using that interface. So here, even like, depending on like what kind of character mode, it's doing it in different ways. But essentially it all streams down into the animation blueprint, which is where we started today. But say we're not in movement actor mode, what happens then? Well, again, using that, um, remember how the mocap actor component had that enum for like the different actor profiles? Most of them just go <laughs> to the same, same exact spot, which is this tier. But otherwise the unknown one, that does things a bit differently. That procedurally creates a control rig based on what tracker is closest to what bone. And it's kind of broken right now, and I don't know how to fix it. It was working okay, like, gosh, when I committed it in, like, pre-Unreal Engine 5. But something happened in, in the uh, conversion that um, hasn't worked the same since. And I really want it to work again, but also IK retargeting is just a, a better version of this. Anyways, most of, most of the um, actor profiles will just go straight into here. And it'll do a branch based on if you're in upper body only mode, which this one, that, that's where I made a mistake. This one will actually set all the goals, uh, the, the transforms of the goals to be in relation to the pelvis. So that way, like if you're sitting or whatever, like I, I could demonstrate it. Maybe, maybe I'll find an old YouTube video of mine. So we also have upper body only mode. Let's get the camera in here. So that means if I'm moving around, you can see the character's not moving. It kind of just like locks me, like pel my pelvis motion. You can see I'm twisting and turning. It um, kind of does, a little bit to take my pelvis motion on up and put onto the actor. So if you want like kind of the actor to be in a very specific spot, that's upper body only mode. And if you don't have feet trackers, that's what it defaults to. I believe that there is a, uh, a bool for it. Yeah, upper body only mode. Um, there's also here upper body only mode. Lots of ways you can turn this on. But again, like if you have say, animation that's already on the character, like you're using that default slot, using a level sequence, you could just go upper body only mode, say if you're sitting down, and only motion capture like 
the upper body. So that's where this big kind of split comes. So you can see it's marked here. This one basically changes um, how the goals are sent, uh, again, in relation to the pelvis. Yeah, if there's any, if this isn't exactly one, say if like you're transitioning between upper body only mode and like the traditional tracked thing, it'll actually run both. So that's why I'm doing this kind of branching here. So yeah, it's basically update goal transforms. So yeah, we're grabbing those, those specific goals, and then we're setting them to a variable, which then gets kind of put into this struct here. And that struct is what gets carried over to the control rig. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens when you calibrate the actor and the different kind of player modes that are in the system. So when we press play, you can see we start off in null mode and then we go into calibration mode. And actually, quick note, if there is no mocap actor target, just press play, it's in null mode. Like we, there's no trackers tracking, nothing's going on. So there's a few ways you can calibrate. One, and this is probably the easiest way, say your inputs aren't, aren't working for your controllers, you can set down here, calibrate after X seconds. Let's go three seconds. Press play, you get this countdown, three, two, one, bam, calibration happens. So then if you want to using the controllers, well, that's using the input graph. So if you want to find the input graph, it's down here. This is uh, input graph here. Event graph is kind of like what happens when you like begin play or event tick. And this is just like a bunch of like interface stuff or like things that I wanted exposed. Um, kind of important stuff like, for instance, loading actor, spawning actors. Whenever you, you have a, a state change, it's kind of a dispatcher. So you can like get logic out to other, other things. Hey, you've actually changed the, the player mode or you've changed which actor you are, that kind of thing. This is how you actually will change the, um, the tracker controlled data. And you know, there's like a bunch of setup stuff, but like, I think the most important of the setup stuff is like here, this is, remember that enum, the tracking method? Here's where like we spawn in different things. Like here's the mega mocap VR um, receiver for OSC. So that's how we would actually get OSC signals from a 5.1 project to a 5.2 for Steam VR spawning in the, the hands. And that's how we're gonna get the finger data. Stuff like that. And I'm probably gonna like expand on this, like the more tracking methods and devices we get. All that stuff is begin play. But when you wanna calibrate, um, you'll probably be using the inputs. And so it's the input B. So if you hold down B on the controller, which there's a, a mapping for other, you know, I'll just actually open up the, the mapping. I do have mappings for other controller types. So B it would be menu on the Vive. Um, or the Mixed Reality menu button, Oculus is Y. So there are other mappings in here. But anyways, when you hold both of those down, and then it's gonna run this calibrate function. So yeah, one of the most important functions in the whole project, um, depending on the tracking method, it'll do something different for a Breckel, but otherwise, it just kind of goes into here. It looks at the actor profile, and um, it basically, yeah, get goal transforms to actor bone. Just open this up. Remember how way back when we look at the mocap actor component, it has a list of bone names. So like, this is like what the, the head bone is called, what the chest bone is called. It's basically using that to get that socket in the actor, get that location and snap that little tiny, remember down here, these goals here, it's gonna snap that into there. And that's what's gonna drive the character around. So calibration is basically telling the system, how far is this tracker away from the intended uh, bone that we want to control? Very important because again, the orientations of the tracker and the bone could be different, all that kind of stuff. Unknown does something different where it, it actually is pretty complicated. Again, I didn't want to talk about it, but it's looking through, it's getting all your track devices and determining what bone is closest to um, what tracker. And if you have any ones that are named, we can actually, change these around like it all starts blank um, if this actor was like unknown these wouldn't auto populate on play but i think if let's see if i press play if it'll auto populate we can take a look at them yeah you see here head head spine all that stuff auto populates based on the um that switching that we do in the the mocap actor component i'm using those names and like i'm finding like because those are important i know that you've like marked out which ones those ones are I'm using those ones to actually update what tracker is, is closest to that bone versus like, say if you had head and lip, 
Head's probably more important, especially if you named it. So um, that'll kind of prevent you if you have like an oddly shaped character, a tracker, basically driving the wrong, the wrong thing. But of course, this mode's kind of broken at the moment. We're also setting the player forward. Like, I don't necessarily know your player orientation. Like, I can guess, but like, it's not until you're standing like this in the, in the A pose that I really know where your forward is. So I think, yeah, I'm just getting like the hips and all that stuff. Basically, yeah, setting, setting that to be like a, a kind of a calibrated, like this is your forward. Again, very important for the system. I use it quite a lot. I'm doing the same thing for the mocap actor. Then we're basically calibrating the player's height. So like I figured, hey, we're doing this with the player. Let's just get their height because they're probably standing up straight. And that'll be used in future um, kind of calibrations. Like whenever you uh, are basically targeting a mocap actor, it'll scale you um, to them based on your actor height. So it's kind of like a, a saved variable. And then we're saving um, the profile. So this is just like your typical save file. You, you create a save game object. I'm just saving all this stuff. So these are all the offsets of those little goals. Plays a sound effect and then we enter actor mode. If you want to see the different modes in the system, they're typically, you just type in MMBR and here are these functions here. So like if you enter null mode, this is what happens in null mode. When you enter calibration mode, this is the kind of stuff that happens in calibration mode. And then this is the stuff that happens in actor mode. So we're going into here. We're basically turning off the bools for calibration mode, director mode, making sure that we're not already in acting mode. If, it, if we are, we just don't do anything. We all, yes, yeah, here as you can see off the, the actor to align with player. That's using those two forwards that I was mentioning earlier. This is a really important um, button here. If you want to see the trackers, like all your goals and trackers and their offsets after you hit calibration, hit this and it'll basically make your mesh visible again. Your, um, all your kind of player pawn mesh stuff. And here we're forcing upper body mode if you have no feet trackers. And then IK retargeting is where things get a little spicy. I don't think I'm gonna necessarily go into like what's going on in here. You can just open these up and see what they do. Like here for setting visibility. Um, looks like I'm just sending some, some data to the mocap actor saying, hey, we're, we are IK retargeting. Here's like the, the source mesh that you're getting your data from. And then, yeah, we just basically will fire this event, which double click on it. This will kind of run us through the, uh, the tracker controlled goals. That'll turn that mode on. Um, yeah, just informing the spectator camera that there's a new actor in town and that's, that's the target. Um, inform the actor itself it's, it's acting. That hasn't really come that useful, but you know, it's there in case we need to use it later on. So this is where we actually send which trackers are missing over to that um, animation blueprint. Yeah, like basically all this stuff, no feet tracker, no chest tracker, all that stuff. And then we're turning off that calibration overlay. So yeah, that's a overview of how the whole system works. There's a lot of other stuff to be discovered in the system as well. Like for instance, the light rig, um, pretty awesome. There's a lot of great tools, POV cam. If you drag this into your scene and you also have to like launch this editor utility widget. So I'm moving the actor around. This is your POV now because basically that little camera I dragged in, this thing, this POV camera, it snaps itself into the head of the actor. And so this is like if you want to have the actor um, see more context of where they are, what they're looking at. Let's see what else is fun in the system. There's a prop thing here, which is super cool. Um, you can put in a uh, live link device ID into here, just press play. And this represents your tracker. You can see it there in frame. You could um, detach the prop from the tracker and then like the tracker can move independently and then you can attach it again just in case the calibration's off. And you can save that um, calibration. So like this prop name will always have that like orientation. Sound effects generator, this thing's really cool. You just basically um, add it to your actor SFX. It gets the velocity of the different trackers, like it stores them over like a few frames and determines if they've stopped. And if they've stopped and they were moving fast before, it'll whoosh. Or if it's a foot, like it basically at the stop will be like, oh, that's a step. Really, really cool. It actually worked really well. Um, don't know if it still works because I haven't tried it out in a while, but that's an option for you. Yeah, you know, of course, let's just look at the light rig editor because it's so cool. And I just did an update to this um, 
basically you can see like the little flashing lights telling us like which um, thing we're actually affecting. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was informative and kind of tells you how Mega Mocap VR is put together and kind of gives you an idea of like some of the workflows in Unreal Engine if you're not familiar, or if you are familiar, how you can actually use that knowledge to further modify the system, um, Mega Mocap VR, because I made it to be open source. You're not supposed to um, sell it to other people. I want it to be free for everybody, but you can do whatever you want with it because you can actually access all the, the code that I put into it. You can either use that to learn or to just change it for your own needs. But again, uh, I made a copy left, so you can't really sell this to other people. I didn't want other people to be taken advantage of in that way. Or me, I guess. I, I've been spending two years making this thing, so don't take advantage of me like that, uh, if possible. <laughs> but I figured this was like a cool tool, that I, something that I wanted to see and something that I wanted to use in Unreal Engine, so I made it. And I figured that'd be useful to other people, so that's why it's free. Uh, and we just actually, I guess this is kind of the YouTube announcement for this, we were awarded a mega grant um, by Epic. So uh, very, very stunned and um, proud, honestly. It's such a validation of this project that I've been uh, putting all my weekends into for a while. So thank you so much um, to Epic Games and to everyone that uses the tool in the community. If you have any questions about how to use the tool, you can join our Discord or send me a message on Twitter. And yeah, I hope that you enjoy the tool and uh, get some good motion capture out of it. And I hope you have a good day. Take care, everyone.